I'm going to start recording. This session will be recorded. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jamie Rarig with the Michigan Good Food Fund at the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems and the Michigan State University Product Center. I'm happy to have you all here today as we learn about the resources that are available to farmers as they're, you're thinking about getting financing. I also want to recognize this year has been incredibly difficult for many people. So I just ask that everybody um, give each other grace and we'll do the best that we can through learning through Zoom and um, participating in these types of events virtually. We have an awesome mix of people here today. In the registration, we asked how many years that you had been farming and we have all the way from zero to 40 plus on this call today. So a really wide, wide range. We also have other resource providers that aren't necessarily presenting today, but are great options for you as you're looking at your finances and looking at lending. We'll have two panels today really talking about the how, why, and what of lending. And then we have our lender panel in the last half of our session that will be led through some um, most frequent questions. We just wanna recognize that MSU is equal opportunity and we provide resources and education to all people. This session, these, these sessions, so this is a series of four sessions and this is our kickoff of our loan preparation series. And it couldn't be possible without all of these organizations and the people that are on this call today. Here's a quick look at who we are and who's been helping to plan these four sessions to make sure that you get the information you need for finance, to go for financing. All right, so I'd like to share a little bit about the Michigan Good Food Fund, and then I'll turn it over to some of my colleagues. The Michigan Good Food Fund is a $30 million loan fund that provides business support and access to lending and financing for good food and farm businesses. We operate through a partnership, and that partnership includes Michigan State Center for Regional Food Systems, the Fair Food Network, the Kellogg Foundation, and then various lenders. We have two on the representatives on the meeting today, Chris Wendell from Northern Initiatives and Mary Donnell from Capital Impact Partners. It's a mission-driven program, so we look for businesses that are providing healthy food access within our communities. They're driving the economy, adding more new jobs to the communities, sourcing locally, and using environmentally sustainable practices within their business. As I mentioned, we um, provide resources and um, business support to good food businesses, which includes all the way from the farm to the fork. So the farmer, all the way to the restaurant or the retailer. Our rates are competitive and through our um, creative lenders, we are able to offer various rates and terms that might be a little bit more flexible than some of the other traditional banks. And we can lend from 2,500 up to $6 million. And here you can see some of the places that have received financing through the Michigan Good Food Fund lenders. This map is a little outdated. We just recently added another loan. So we are up to about $16 million invested in our state through this program in about five years time. So to continue on who we are, we are also members of the MSU Product Center team and MSU Extension. We provide education, marketing, farm tours, and we even have a farm finance team if you didn't know about that, and some of them are on this call today. Um, the MSU Product Center helps to bring value-added products to market. Our team provides one-on-one -on -one business coaching, and last year we helped um, 772 businesses. As we're going through this, I'm trying to monitor at the same time people that might be in the waiting room. So just please be patient. Okay, so as I said, um, in the chat box, 
please enter a number between one and 50 if you'd be interested in attending this week's virtual Great Lakes Produce Expo. Right now I only have two, so I'll leave, give a little bit more time for people to add a number. Um, we're also providing up to 10 awards for businesses who need access to accounting services to help them get more loan ready. So if you're interested in that, I'll give you some more information towards the end on how you can apply. All right, next I wanna turn it over to my colleagues to talk more about why, how, and what about lending. This is gonna provide you with an opportunity to learn why your personal credit score is important in lending, why what you're gonna need and really give a great example of what you can do um, to build more revenue within your business. First, we're gonna start with the importance of personal credit. And I'd love to introduce you to Jennifer Ortquist who works with us at MSU Extension and is part of our personal finance team. Well, great. Thank you so much, Jamie. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So we're going to talk briefly about the importance of personal credit and how it really impacts your ability to pursue um, additional forms of, of credit or financial resources, such as um, business loans. You can see I have contact information and I will put a plug in later on about our website, mymoneyhealth.org. So what is credit really? It's buying something or utilizing a service such as utilities now and promising to pay for it later. So two main things impact our ability to pursue credit. One is our credit report, which is much like a report card. It really gives some, some intricate information about us, who we are, who we have utilized in the past in regards to credit and how we're managing that debt. Do we pay our payments on time? And do we have some negative historical information such as bankruptcy or foreclosure? There are three main credit bureaus. There are more, but these are the three main consumer reporting agencies for credit, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And we're going to talk about why it's so important to get your free credit reports on a regular basis. We highly recommend annualcreditreport.com. That's the official place to get your free credit reports. Prior to COVID-19, we were allowed to get one per bureau each year, so every 12 months. But due to COVID-19, you can now get your credit reports weekly from creditreport.com. And you can do that on the website at their phone number or mailing in a request. And it's really critical to do that because you can see if information regarding you is correct and also keep your eye open for identity theft. So what will you see in your report if you've never looked at it before? Again, some identifying information, name, address, sometimes your employer, credit history. Do you have open active trade lines? Do you have things that have been closed? Have you maxed out credit? cards, as well as inquiries. Are you intentionally seeking credit on a regular basis, which can be hard hits, which can pull your credit score down? And is there any public record information on file? So if you have gone through something that would impact your score negatively, such as bankruptcy, foreclosure, or a charge off. This is the standard timeline and how long that will stay in your credit report. But as I always say in my classes, if you have gone through something such as this, it doesn't mean that you can't begin making positive behaviors today that over time will help pull your score back up. So why is it important to have good credit? It definitely helps us have access to loans and, and other forms of credit, as well as the cost of what we're going to pay for that access. The lower a credit score, the more we're going to pay to access credit. Yes, it can help us get a job or rent an apartment, but it may also impact your ability to lease space for your business. It can also impact your insurance premium costs and lastly, establishing utilities. So what is a credit score? We talked about a credit report being much like a report card. A credit score is very similar to a grade based on what is inside our credit reports. It's actually a number for creditors and lenders, and it helps predict how much of a credit risk we will be in regards to pursuing a product or service through them. Remember, it's based on the information in your credit report. And it's important to mention there are two main credit scoring models, the FICO credit score and the Vantage score. This pie chart is a nice summary of how the FICO score, which is oftentimes referred to as the industry standard, 
that's how the FICO score is calculated. Notice the biggest piece of the pie is payment history. That really zooms in on do we pay our bills on time? The amount owed has to do with how we're managing the credit we have access to. Are we maximizing our credit cards or maxing them out? The three smaller pieces of the pie, what types of credit do we have? Are they all credit cards? Do we have some installment loans such as auto, mortgage, or student loans? Do we access new credit on a regular basis every time we open a new line of credit that does pull down our score? And then lastly, the length of credit history. That means how long have you actually had established credit? So here's a quick snapshot of how the FICO score calculates our, our score and what the range means. Many credit card companies are now providing your FICO score for free on a monthly statement, either monthly or quarterly. You can see that below 620 could be better, but 750 and above is considered excellent. So what are some quick tips for improving your credit score? Don't forget to get your credit report on a regular basis. Any inaccuracies, be sure to correct them immediately. Pay bills on time. Try to minimize outstanding debt. Remember that the second biggest piece of the pie is how we manage the credit we have. Only open new accounts if needed, because remember, when you apply for a line of credit, even if you are denied, that can pull your score down. Manage your existing accounts responsibly. And there is a strategy to help improve credit score. That is to contact a credit card company and seek if they will increase your credit limit. But I always ex express that one with caution. If you do increase your credit limit, yes, it may low, um, improve your credit score, but you might be tempted to add more to that existing credit card. Lastly, non-traditional forms of credit. There are some self-reporting entities where you can report your own behavior in areas such as rent payments that may not be traditionally calculated in a credit score. Keep in mind, some lenders use these, some lenders don't. For example, rentalkarma.com or Experian Boost. And again, we do not endorse these products or services. Again, tips to build your credit, pay bills on time, get those credit reports, and don't forget to report identity theft. If you get your report and notice something on there that's not yours, act immediately. Just um, search ftc.gov. It'll tell you how to um, move forward in reporting that identity theft. And again, watch your credit utilization ratio. That means how much credit do you have. So start today, make positive changes, consider a supportive money management class. We offer free classes on a regular basis. For example, make a spending plan work for you. And don't forget the benefit of your local 211. If you do experience an unexpected financial hardship, they can provide access to information or local resources that may be beneficial to you and your family. And thank you very much for letting me be a part of today. Thank you, Jennifer. That was great. It's important for all of us to hear those messages. Um, if we've ever checked our credit score or never checked it, we still need to be reminded of it all. So thank you for joining us today. All right, next I'd like to turn it over to Jake Earhart, who's my colleague at the MSU Product Center and Extension, and Mary Donnell from Capital Impact Partners, who's my colleague with the Michigan Good Food Fund. Together, they're gonna explain a little bit more on the why we should be ready for financing. If there was ever a year that we saw a reason, it's this year when the emergency loan funds came out, if you didn't have your financial documents ready, you might not have been able to apply, or if you weren't associated with a bank, you may not have been able to apply. Um, again, it's been a very difficult year and we've had lots of lessons learned, I think, throughout this. All right, Jay, take it away. Great, thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jamie said, I work for Michigan State University Extension down in Washtenaw County. My whole job is to help farmers make more money. Um, and so uh, we're gonna talk um, about why you should get a loan. Um, the long and short of it really is to buy something that is necessary for you to make a profit. Um, so say you're a salad greens farmer and you know you need to be producing salad greens in the late fall and early spring in order to make enough revenue to make a profit for your farm. So buying a $20,000 hoop house with a loan is a smart idea to help make that profit for you. Um, similarly, uh, maybe you need a tractor um, to do some belly mounted cultivation um, because the labor involved in hand hoeing or hand weeding all of those garden beds is just not gonna cut it. Um, so these are just examples of uh, why you would get a loan. 
understandably in the farm world, there's a lot of fear around getting a loan. I've heard multiple times from farmers, I don't want to go into debt. You know, like I've heard of farmers drowning in loans and I don't want to be one of those. Um, so I, I'm going to share an example of why um, financing something, financing a piece of equipment, especially on, on just the revenue made at, at year end, is actually sometimes not advantageous and getting a loan is, is, is um, a much better option. So, um, so say you're an egg farmer, you're producing 80 dozen eggs a day, and you're selling them at $5 a dozen. Um, that's $400 in daily projected revenue, annually $146,000. Uh, that's, that, that's a good amount of money. But you're hand washing those dang eggs, and it takes four hours to wash all those eggs and grate them and package them and candle them. Um, that's $100 in daily labor, ending up being about $36,000 um, in, in annual labor. So say you buy an egg washer for $10,000. You get a loan for this egg washer. This, this egg washer reduces your, uh, your, your labor cost um, to just one hour a day annually. That's just $9,000 um, rather than that $36,000. So this saves you over $27,000 in labor in a year, which absolutely pays for that dang egg washer. But say you're a little nervous about taking out a loan. You're not sure, you, you feel like the bank might reject you. Um, and so you just decide I'm going to net $2,000 for five years to pay for this washer. Um, and after five years, you can buy it. However, over those five years, now you've, you've spent 136, almost 137,000 in labor that you could have been uh, using your time in, in other places to make more money for your farm or grow your operation. Um, so in many ways, and with the right planning, taking a loan out is actually a very advantageous um, business uh, decision. Next slide, Jamie. So, what what should I take a loan out for? Um, typically, loans are taken out for in or sorry for equipment, as I've been using these examples, um, or inventory. If uh, inventory at the beginning of the year, and then you'll know you'll sell it over the over the course of a year. However, loans can be taken out for a variety of things, um, including your payroll or electricity, supplies, rent. Um, but you want to be careful with those kinds of expenses. Those should be um, those should be covered with your general business operating expenses. Next. And lastly, um, on my part, please don't finance your business on a credit card. Uh, credit card interest rates are so high. I put 12%. I've seen much higher than that. Um, and the lenders we're going to talk we're going to talk with today, um, their programs can have anywhere from three to eight percent, um, maybe a little bit more, but definitely better than a credit card. So now I'm going to pass it on to Mary, um, who's going to talk talk a little bit about being ready for financing and what this means. Hi, I'm Mary Donnell. Thank you, Jay. Um, Mary Donnell with Capital Impact Partners. We're a nonprofit community development financial institution, and we are the fund administrators of the Michigan Good Food Fund. I'm just going to take a few minutes to continue to try to, to motivate you to keep good accurate business financial records, that it's not just an advantage to you if you want to apply for a loan, but it also helps you analyze your cost of goods sold while you're running your business. So you can explore areas of savings and efficiencies. And you also know when your profits actually equal your costs and your business breaks even or it's making a profit. It's, um, and I used to work with a lot of greenhouse growers who had many different uh, varieties of flowers in their greenhouses. And they actually, without good business records, didn't know which crops made the money and which ones lost the money. So good financial records help you keep track of which crops or products are profitable and which are not. So you can make data-driven decisions as you plan for the future. You also have the financial information to make informed decisions during times like a COVID-19 pandemic when you have an economic downturn and you are ready, like Jamie said, to apply for programs and grants that are designed to help farmers and businesses. And it also helps you know how much debt you can afford if you have an interest in applying for a loan. And then um, if, if you have those financial records in order, you have the information a lender needs, if you do want to apply for a loan, 
which can increase the number of lenders who may lend to you. It may decrease the amount of time for a lender to make a decision uh, or a loan, and it may decrease the interest rate and definitely improve your chances of success. So um, don't be afraid to, to dive in, get your finances in order so you can run your business as efficiently as possible. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Florencia. Thank you. Thanks, Jay and Mary. Thank you, Mary. And so in the next five minutes, I am going to speed through a few different options on how to be ready for financing. I am with Michigan State University Extension with a farm business management team. So to be ready for financing, you need to have good information about your farm. This includes both financial and production information. These two sets of records are important in and of themselves, but they are even more important when you use one to understand and make decisions about the other. In the production realm, record keeping is pretty straightforward. For uh, crops, you need to know acreage, yield, and value of crops sold. And in the livestock realm, you need to know quantity and value of products sold per month. On the financial side, though, there is a pretty long list of different categories that you need to keep track of. Not all may apply to you, but here to the left, there's a list of income categories and to the right, there's a series of expense categories. And while not pictured here, there's also asset, equity, and liability categories or accounts. This comprehensive list is called the chart of accounts. Um, so while accounting may seem complicated at first, there are many tools you can use and many of them are free of charge. Here's a few examples. You could keep pictures of your receipts instead of paper ones, which is where Google Drive, Google Photos, OneDrive, or Office Lens come in handy. For keeping track of transactions, there are plenty of applications you can download on your phone or use on your computer. Social, Mint, and Wave are just a few examples. I believe all banks these days give you access to Excel records of your transactions, and of course, there's also Google Sheets. And finally, why not use good old paper and pen? Any of these will be better than a shoebox of discolored receipts at the end of the year. So I want to briefly introduce you to the Farm Records Book for Management that you can use to enter your transactions on paper. It is an, it, it's available for $15 on the MSU Extension online bookstore, or you can also get it for an extra fee from your local extension office. We are working on translating it into Spanish as well. And here's a picture of the booklet. The Good Food Fund actually has purchased a bunch of these for this group in advance, and they are giving them away for free to those interest. So make sure to ask Jamie for your copy after the webinar. If you prefer to work on the computer, you can go to bit.ly forward slash farm records book on your browser and access the farm records book free of charge. We'll send all these links to you later. So then uh, you can either print it at home or download it to Excel or use it right into Google Sheets. And the Farm Records Book for Management is basically a set of tables, if you got, go back one, uh, where you can enter your transactions by date in the different categories. It is organized the same way income taxes are. So a benefit is that it makes tax filing easy, whether you are doing it yourself or using a compute, uh, tax preparer. On another hand, the Farm Records Book was designed to be simple, so it does not have formulas. So it's up to you to add up things right or enter formulas in the spreadsheet yourself if you prefer. If you are into formulas or a bit more complex spreadsheets, though, you can try the farm cash tracker, which, which was the one you were just showing, Jamie, which you can find in this link here on this slide. Uh, the farm cash tracker has a few benefits over the farm records book, and it's also free of charge. So go to the next. If you are into formulas, um, I'm sorry. Um, so the farm cash trigger has a few benefits over the farm records book. It lets you copy and paste reports straight from your bank or application websites. It lets you work with several different cash and checking accounts. So for example, if you sometimes transfer money between different bank accounts or want to keep track of movements between cash and bank accounts, the farm records book does not have an easy way to do that while this tracker does. This is because it uses a double entry system, and that's why you see incoming and outgoing accounts on the columns to the right. Okay, go to the next, and this is the summary page of the farm cash tracker that will summarize your transactions per month. 
and as a year total. And it will also give you a lot of information, for example, net income and cash flow information. Go to the next. If you think you are ready for a paid record keeping system, and I know the uh, Good Food Fund has also, has also got some money for that for you, um, I would recommend the Tell Farm program, in which for only $550 per, per year, you get all of these things listed here. The most of which being, in my opinion, the fact that they review and back up your work. There's also tax benefits and a lot of education. And they work with QuickBooks and PCMars, which is another record keeping software designed specifically for farms. So go to the next. And finally, no matter which accounting system you will use, these folks here who are MSU Extensions Farm Business Management Educators, me being to the left here, can help you put together a complete financial analysis. And um, I'm not gonna explain it now, but as long as you collect all the information, we can, uh, help you get a financial analysis ready, like an accurate uh, income statement, um, which I'm showing one on the next slide, as long as you have collected all the information throughout the year. So this is the report that we're gonna send you on your way with. It's a true income statement. It's also got a balance sheet and a lot of great information that lenders do look at. Um, so to wrap up, I invite you to connect by subscribing to my mailing list. Uh, using this link that's on this slide. And look up my articles, videos, and podcasts on the MSU Extension website by searching for my name, Florencia Colella. Uh, you can even set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me using finding my name on the MSU Extension website. And you can also find me on social media. So thank you. Thank you, Florencia. It wasn't the best uh, slide tracker for you on that one. Sorry about that. Okay, everybody. So I'm seeing some activity in the chat. And I mentioned that this session is being recorded and we'll get the recording available next week and out to everybody. And if you have an interest in the slides, I'll ask everyone on here if it's okay to share. Next up, we have some questions that we thought were very important and that a lot of you have had over the years that you'd want to hear directly from the financial institution representatives on the call today. Um, Jay? Yeah. From here? I'm gonna, yes. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see people's faces better. Perfect. Um, and actually, if we can have um, those who have previously shared um, to, to turn their video off um, so that our panelists, Jamie, you can stay on, of course, um, so that our panelists are the, are the video and, um, and we don't get all confused. Um, with who's who and who's on the who, who's on the panel. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, Florencia, Jamie, and Mary, um, for all of the that good background information um, and for, of course, planning this um, this whole workshop. Um, we are now moving into the meat of today. The thing that I'm most excited about was just to really hear from our lenders. Um, these are the folks who are going to be. Um, presenting to you over, this, over the course of the session on the January, February, and March dates. Um, so we're gonna ask them some questions. We're gonna hear directly from the horse's mouth um, all, of, uh, all of these details that, um, that hopefully will help you in, in thinking about uh, approaching a lender. Um, so we are joined today by Jennifer Whitford from Greenstone Farm Credit Service, Chris Wendell, from Northern Initiatives, which is a CDFI based in Northern Michigan. Hi, Chris. And Dave Russ from the USDA Farm Service Agency. And these are all three lenders that are very typical for farms to, to work with. Um, so to start, uh, our first question for you guys is to please introduce yourself, make it nice and easy, um, the type of institution that you work for and generally how it operates. So Jennifer, let's start with you. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Whitford. I'm with Greenstone Farm Credit Services. I've been with Greenstone for a little over 17 years. My first seven years having sat on the financial side, working strictly with the numbers, um, balance sheets as a credit analyst. Um, the last 10 years I've worked as a loan officer, uh, serving the greater Gratiot County area for um, in the central part of Michigan. 
Uh, Greenstone Farm Credit Services is a member of the farm credit system. We represent um, over 2,500 or 25,000, excuse me, members um, throughout Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Um, we are a member owned cooperative and we focus mainly on um, farm customers, rural properties. We um, specialize in lending to these areas, um, the rural areas of America. Um, if you are not in the state of Michigan, there are farm credits throughout the US. So if you wanna look up your local farm credit, you can probably um, best do that through a Google search. Um, we do offer here at Greenstone uh, broad base of uh, financial solutions, including lending, um, but we also offer insurances, crop insurance, um, life insurance, and accounting and tax services. So we do have a broad spectrum of things available. Thank you, Jennifer. Chris, let's move on to you. Hi, I'm Chris Wendell. I'm with Northern Initiatives. We are a community development financial institution or a CDFI that's uh, based out of Marquette. We started about 25 years ago and we do two things. We lend money and that's to small businesses. About 30% of the businesses we lend to are startup businesses, but we also have an affinity to the farm and food sector. The other thing we do is we work a lot with the businesses that borrow money from us to help build systems within their business to help them understand uh, financial, the financial side, the marketing side, and the management side of running a business so they can get, if they are in that startup phase or even in a uh, somewhat a small business uh, phase, to get them to the point where they can grow uh, if they choose to do that and scale up and add employees and become uh, really vital parts of their community. And we really look for projects where somewhat of an economic development organization. Uh, we look for projects that can really make a difference within their community. And that many times are far, that can include farms or food related businesses. Um, I'm gonna cut it short there so I don't take up too much time. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, that's perfect. And Dave, last but not least. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Dave Russ. I'm with the USDA Farm Service Agency. Uh, I'm currently the farm loan chief, and in that capacity, I oversee FSA's loan operations throughout the state of Michigan. Um, we've got about 3,000 customers statewide. Um, we've got a number of offices scattered throughout the state that serve our individual farm customers quite directly. Farm Service Agency is a, of course, a national organization, a federal agency. And so if you are joining us from any remote location from around the country, similar as Jennifer said, you could Google and find your local Farm Service Agency office and your loan officers that work in that local area to serve what your particular needs are. FSA works primarily with what we refer to as beginning farmers, uh, those that don't have a ton of farming experience and therefore are less likely to be an attractive candidate for a commercial lender. So FSA then serves a very important role to that beginning farmer to help that customer kind of get those initial steps and some of those in initial pieces under their belt so that eventually they can turn to a private commercial lender to take on that credit in some capacity. So we've got a number of loan programs that can help those beginning farmers through our direct lending program. But then also we've got a very active guaranteed program where a commercial lender, whether it's farm credit or any other commercial lender is willing to make that loan, but there's some piece of risk associated with it where they don't want to assume that risk all on their own. So they then in turn come to FSA and we can guarantee that credit which makes that lender much more willing to be involved in some farming operations they, that they wouldn't otherwise. So that's just a little uh, background. I've been with the agency for uh, 29 years and a lots of experience in a number of different capacities and uh, be interested in having a conversation about farm lending. Great, thank you, Dave. It's a great overview. Um, Jennifer, this question is just for you. Um, uh, because it's a pretty general question. How can working with a lender, so for a farmer to work with a lender, how can that farmer help, how can a lender help that farmer meet their business goals? So I think um, working with a lender is really important, whether you have an immediate credit request or if you have future growth plans, if you're a startup or your existing business, um, working with a lender is gonna help you 
obtain those goals because there isn't always the cash available, right? Especially in the beginning of startup mm -hmm. operations or in the example of the chicken and the egg washer, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of opportunities where loans can kind of fill a void for purchases, things to kind of move and progress and, and build your business. Um, and having that relationship with a lender is just a really good start for developing those business goals. Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so now this question is for all three of you. Um, where stories can tell, um, stories can be great at um, transmitting information. And so we were wondering if, if each of you, without using any names, um, can share an example of a great lending experience you had with a beginning entrepreneur. Chris, let's start with you this time. Well, yeah, I think uh, my story has to do with somebody that had a little bit of a business experience. It was a farm stand and they realized that just trying to operate on a seasonal basis wasn't going to work for them. And it was a couple that I would call encore entrepreneurs. In other words, they had careers prior to getting into farming and they decided that they wanted to do something different in their retirement. And they started the farm stand, but then the idea was that in the small town they were located in, to, they came to us when they wanted to buy a small building and have an indoor farmer's market so they could extend their season, maybe bring in some other um, items that they could sell well into the fall and maybe into the winter. So what happened is that worked fairly well for a short period of time, but it was not generating the type of uh, income that it needed to. So uh, the business actually started to make prepared meals and that they were sold initially to people within that community that might not have had a lot of time to make uh, meals for their busy family. And uh, then that evolved into that, that company actually uh, preparing meals for senior centers and all kinds of other vertical markets that we never imagined when we did their initial business plan. So what I liked about this business owner is that they were able to really um, think and learn and understand that just the way you, def the way you define your business in the beginning is probably not the way it's ever going to play out. And I think that's what made them, uh, number one, be able to have the income to help pay their loan back, but also grow the business and add employees and be a real vital part of their community. Great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's a good lesson on it's okay to pivot <laughs> and, and taking a loan out in order to pivot is just fine. Um, Dave, let's go to you. Do you have an example? Yeah, Judy, thanks. Uh, the one operation I'm I'm thinking of it was a it was a startup kind of a small vegetable type operation. Uh, I, I take a little different approach on this. Their initial request was pretty significant. The agency then worked with that customer to kind of pare down the initial request because this business is risky. Ag lending is a risky business. In jumping in with both feet all at once uh, gives many lenders a. Uh, a, a bit of a, a nervous, uh, nervous approach to that. And so what the agency actually did is work with that individual customer, pair that request back to start to uh, approach their long-term goals incrementally instead of jumping in with both feet saying, okay, we have to do everything at uh, once. And then we began to work with that operation on a much smaller scale uh, but then over time, it did grow, and the agency continued to be involved from a financing perspective to the point where they were actually pretty successful. And in the end, they actually came back to the agency and thanked us for kind of the, the slow approach. Now, I understand completely that can be often frustrating is as an entrepreneur, you want to go for it. You want to jump in with both feet. Uh, you want to kind of barrel forward. Sometimes those experts in the field have got some experience that they can lend to you, kind of provide you some advice. Those, uh, those lenders probably are doing it for all the right reasons. Make sure you don't become over leveraged, that you're planning for contingencies that always come up in some of these operations. So we ultimately had a very successful relationship between that relatively small initial vegetable operation and one that grew to be fairly successful over time as we kind of walked through that on a slow sort of basis. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. That's, that just highlights how a lender isn't just 
uh, a yes, no person. Yes, you can have this much money. No, you cannot have this much money. Um, but they're really working with the client um, on, on, on a case by case basis and almost acting as a counselor. Um, so thank you for that. That's great. Jennifer, on to you. Yeah, I um, I really want to echo Dave's comments about um, the taking it slow, starting out small, and in developing that relationship over time. I think that something that's really important in all of this is that lenders are not just yes, no. We're here to help you grow and help you develop your goals, whether it's you know a green stone, a farm credit, um, some of the community partners that are on this call that were introduced earlier. I think that it's really important to understand that it may not just be one thing in one thing now, it's, it's a relationship um, and in something that grows over time and it may have to start out small. And in some of my, my um, great customers that I work with every day, you know, they started out buying three cows and, and now we have, we have 103 cows. We have built a house, we've bought a farm, they've gotten married, they have children. Um, you, see, you see those families, those relationships um, and all those things grow. And, and that's, that's really what I enjoy about the job is being able to help fulfill the needs. And, and it's not always a, a yes, no, it's a, okay, you know, where do we start and, and where, how do we get there from here? And, and, and ultimately sometimes too, I think with the, with the producers and the customers is, you know, what are your goals? Um, you know, because because if we can segment things out and say, okay, these are my long-term goals, but what are my short-term goals? And kind of look at things independent of each other and, and just talk through things and, and have that relationship and the conversation is really great. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, you become a friend over time. Um, so we're gonna move on to a question that's a little more concrete. Um, my question for you three is what are the two to three most important documents um, that a borrower needs when they approach you for a loan? And of those two to three, what's often missing when a new beginning farmer approaches you? Um, Dave, let's start with you this time. And thanks, G. You know, there's a couple things that almost every lender is going to expect from an applicant, and that is a well-prepared balance sheet that you as a customer can prepare. That doesn't mean we can't provide some help and some assistance, but again, if we're gonna provide some financial assistance, the lender wants to have a pretty good understanding of where that customer is from a kind of a financial acumen sort of standpoint. And so we would wanna certainly see a balance sheet that is relatively up to date, typically within 90 days of when you approach that lender, you would wanna have an updated balance sheet uh, year-end balance sheets are often very important in the ag industry because of how inventory changes over time. And so having balance sheets, what we might refer to as bookend balance sheets, is very important from a lender's perspective to give us a good understanding of where your financial circumstances are. Uh, so that balance sheet is critical uh, at that initial kind of phase of discussion. Uh, an income statement is important, uh, maybe less so from the agency's perspective as a cash flow would be. There's some fine line differences between those two documents. The cash flow really dictates kind of the sources of revenue and how those sources of revenue are going to be spent, whether it's on the expense side or it's when, whether it's on the debt obligation side. So the balance sheet and that cash flow would be a couple key documents that we would certainly look for. The document that we often find is, is maybe not as much missing as lacking, and that is a marketing plan. And when I say marketing plan, somewhat of a concrete marketing plan. Uh, something probably more than I've done a fair amount of research and I know this is going to work because uh, I've heard this working elsewhere. Uh, Something a little more specific is what we would like to see is, okay, I, I intend to raise uh, some farm raised fish and I'm gonna sell those into the Grand Rapids market, for example. Well, that's a good theory, but have you been able to do that? Have you talked with restaurant owners? Have you talked with wholesalers about the purchase of those products and how you're gonna then market them? So that marketing piece, like I said, is, is often there 
but sometimes there's some missing pieces to that, and that is the concrete part of that marketing plan. Great, thank you, Dave. I can relate. Sometimes I hear farmers say, "Oh yeah, no, uh, 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 Kroger will buy everything I have." I'm like, really? <laughs> um, so yes, that marketing plan is is very important. Um, Jennifer, do you have some stuff to add? What is what does Greenstone look for um, with a new and beginning farmer? Again, we're going to look for that balance sheet and having that um, kind of co coincide and, and align with your income taxes is really important. And even if you are a startup business, looking at that balance sheet for your first year, for your second year, having those similar dates on those balance sheets is going to be really important. Um, just because a lot of times what happens is the income taxes are not showing profitability, but if your business and your balance sheet is growing, your balance sheet is gonna be that um, proof for us, the growth in that um, and in kind of some of the evidence that we're gonna look for in the fact that your business is growing because your balance sheet should be growing over time. Um, and, and like I said, even if it's a small balance sheet and it's a startup, it's important to kind of just start tracking that from year to year um, so that you have something to, to give to your lender when you do sit down and meet. Um, we're going to look for a balance sheet, income statements, whether they're, you know, um, from a computer generated program or in the form of an income tax return. Um, the other thing we're going to look for is a projection and, and Dave kind of refers to it as a marketing plan. Um, we're going to want to know where you're going to go with the product. We're also going to want to know the realistic expenses associated with creating that product. Um, so that's kind of something that, that maybe lacks detail or ne just needs some support in, in not that we're going to require a very formalized business plan, but if you can have something in writing of kind of telling me more about how you are going to grow fish and how you are going to market them in the research that you've done, that's great. That that's really helpful information when we have our initial meetings. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. And Chris, um, on to you. What are the two to three most important documents and what's missing sometimes? Yeah, I think great minds think alike because mine are not that much different from Jennifer and Dave's. <laughs> um, and, and I would, I think uh, when I think of cash flow, I think of a monthly cash flow statement. In other words, you want to be able to prove that the uh, inflow and outflow of cash on a monthly basis doesn't leave you in a deficit, especially if you're in a seasonal business that relies on uh, your income coming in for maybe in the farming industry, for example, a few short months in the summer. Uh, but I kind of flip these upside down. I, I, the first thing I look at, cash flow is, is paramount and very important. But prior to that, and I think it goes into the marketing plan. I, I think of it as proof of concept. Who are the people you are selling your product or service to? Are they going to buy on a regular basis and an ongoing basis to make sure you have that income coming in and Will sustain itself. I, I see. Uh, I think the marketing plan is very important. I see too many businesses that start and they kind of use the uh, build it and they will come philosophy without proving that there are people that are uh, liking or want to purchase whatever they are selling. Um, so I think you just use all those things. The balance sheet is critical as well. But I, again, it's proof of concept. Knowing you have enough people and then enough people and enough income and enough uh, ongoing income. And then having that cash flow uh, that can support the business throughout the year without you having a huge deficit. Great. Thank you, Chris. So we're hearing some common themes among all these lenders, um, balance sheets, cash flow statements, some of these like financial records, um, in addition to everyone used a different word, but there was the marketing plan or the proof of concept or the business plan. Um, if these things uh, bring, bring anxiety to your heart, um, that's where you can reach out to our farm service team like Florencia who presented today. Um, Cause that's, they're the folks who can help you get that thing ready. All right, next question for our lenders. Um, is there, uh, what is the average time from a, from, from a farmer approaching you for a loan to actually having money in hand? And I know this can vary, um, but just, just give us a ballpark of, of how, what, what sort of timeline farmers should be thinking about as they think about approaching um, a lender. 
And Jennifer, let's start with you this time. I think um, that question has a very large window and I think it de it really depends on the size and the scope of the request. Um, you know, if you're looking at a smaller scale request for livestock operating machinery, um, those types of things, I would, you know, if you're a brand new customer to Greenstone, it depends somewhat seasonally too, because our winter months do tend to be our busier months. So the turnaround time could be a lot slower. Um, as far as real estate financing goes, you know, if we're partnering with the farm service agency for a participation or a beginning farmer type loan, those do take a little bit more time. Um, there's a lot of parts and pieces involved in that. So, you know, we have to order appraisals, we have to do title work. Um, those sorts of things all kind of come into play and they all take a little bit of time. So if you're looking at, you know, a short term request, um, you know, I, I think a few weeks, depending on how much information is presented up front um, and, and how much information is presented at application time, that really can determine how long it will take you to, to know from a lender. If you have a relationship with a lender, you have met, you've met, you've provided the documents, you, you know, you kind of have established some of those things. Hey, I'm looking to buy um, some cattle sometime. And then you find those cattle. Well, if your lender has all the information up front, they can really act on that quickly. Um, but if it's, if you have to introduce all that information in the beginning, it's, it's not going to be a quick turnaround. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And Chris. If we had this conversation nine or 10 months ago, I would have said four to six weeks for a micro loan of $50,000 or less. And that would be a pretty average scenario. But I think what's happened to at least our organization is that we've had to really uh, turn a lot of our focus to the existing borrowers that we have. Now we've kind of gotten to the point where we've come full circle and we're looking at new loan opportunities once again. So I, I can't hold myself or Northern initiatives to that four to six week period because a lot of the factors that Jennifer talked about come into play. Um, I do know that when we ask for information and the prospective borrower or the applicant can get us that information quickly, that helps. And we ask for a lot of information because we typically take on more risk than a traditional financial institution like a bank or a credit union. Um, therefore, we ask for a little bit more information. And we're also, the information we ask for is sometimes tied to the um, government or federal program where that funding is coming from. So I tell people, look, if I ask you for the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West, I expect you to try to get that for, for us. Um, and it sounds a little silly, but that kind of puts you ahead of the people that might hesitate. At the same time, um, we also offer beyond the micro loan, we can have a, a guaranteed loan where the loan is actually uh, guaranteed a, a large portion of it by perhaps the Small Business Administration. When we get through our approval, then there's an SBA or Small Business Administration approval after that. So all in all, we try to stick to that four to six week period, but circumstances can change with the borrower and circumstances can change with us as well. So um, I hope that helps. I know it's not a definite answer, but it's the best I can do right now. <laughs> no, it, it, it helps. Just having that like, like loose understanding of the timeline, I think is really helpful. Um, all right, Dave, and how about your timeline at the USDA FSA office? Yeah, you know, very similar to what Chris and Jennifer indicated, it's going to be pretty variable based on the nature of the request. Um, I think both of them pointed out a couple of very key factors. Chris mentioned you need to be responsive to your lender. You are asking them to take on a risk. When they ask you for some information, you need to be responsive to that request. Now, it needs to be within reason. I suppose if it's the broomstick, well, I guess your, your lender asks for that. You need to go about, uh, you need to go about getting that. Um, you know, similar as, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, the shorter term operating type loans, um, maybe in the three to four week range, uh, the uh, real estate loans where there's an appraisal required, there's title work required, perhaps there's a survey involved in that, you know, that, uh, that request can very easily go two or three months. Um, I guess the bottom line would be, and Jennifer alluded to this, the, the more frequently you're engaged with your lender, earlier on in that process, 
uh, well before you're signing a purchase agreement. If you're signing a purchase agreement and now only going to a lender, you're going to be behind the eight ball in that process. Is if you're contemplating purchase of real estate, for example, six, eight months from now, you need to be talking with a lender right now about kind of your big picture thinking and, and what, you're, uh, what you're hoping to do and some of those sorts of things so that when that right property appears, you're at least better able to then react under those circumstances, provide your lender with some updated balance sheet and income statement and purchase agreement and lots of those sorts of things. So you probably can't engage your lender too soon. Sooner is always better than later. Um, you know, some of these requests uh, that, hey, I need this next week. Uh, that's probably not going to happen with a whole lot of lenders in the ag financing business. It depends on what it is and in, in kind of your financial circumstances, but that's kind of a rare circumstance under those conditions. Great. Thank you, Dave. That's, that's helpful. Um, we have five minutes left. And so I'm actually going to take an audience question. Um, we had uh, one of our participants write into the chat um, a question that I think um, would be really great to hear all of your answers for. Um, and so Caleb's asking, um, in starting, th they're starting a new farm. Um, it's a new farmer with no assets. How do you handle those kinds of farmers who might not have any, any assets and or ones who might be showing a loss year to year? Um, so Chris, can we start with you? Well, I guess there might be some qualifying questions. Are they going to purchase something with the loan proceeds that would be an asset? And if that was the case, that would be something we could use as collateral. If uh, taking that into account, and even if uh, they don't, then there are some things we kind of look at what we call globally, uh, the, the credit history of the individual. I think Jennifer kind of alluded to that when she was talking about credit um, and also with a comment that she made earlier. So. It might, it might end up being on the front end more of a signature note, almost where we're taking um, into account the cash flow, not just of the, of the business into the future, but also maybe some family members that are involved. Um, so we're looking at personal income combined with the business perspective uh, income as well. Um, so th that's a, it's a challenge on the front end, but we do enough loans that are for people in that situation where it's not impossible. Great. Thank you, Chris. And Dave? Uh, yeah, if you, I, I maybe throw an audible at you here. What, what's interesting, the very next question is, well, I'm asset rich and cash strapped, <laughs> which is nearly the opposite of, of Caleb's inquiry, which is kind of interesting, which is what we often see is some huge variability in this industry. Uh, but to answer this specific question about, uh, you know, not a lot of ag assets, that's not necessarily problematic. As Chris alluded to, there's a lot of qualifications here. But, um, you know, if the agency is providing financing to purchase farm assets, whether it's a tractor or some equipment, some of those sorts of things, those become the agricultural asset. And the agency would then acquire those items as security. We would work through the cash flow piece of that. Where is that cash flow coming from? in terms of how is this debt going to be repaid and some of those sorts of things. So the, the fact that there are no ag assets immediately is not necessarily kind of a, um, you know, it, it's better for a lender to have more collateral often, but that's not the end of the story. If there's more to your story in terms of here's where I've been, here's where I'd like to go, and here's how I see me getting there, and then describe that for your lender, we can certainly work with that. And so the fact there aren't any ag assets immediately isn't necessarily the end of that conversation. Excellent, thank you, Dave. And Jennifer, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, I think that that's a really good uh, unique situation. I shouldn't say it's not a terribly unique situation, quite honestly. And, and I think that that's a great opportunity where Greenstone um, would look to partner with the Farm Service Agency, either through participation loans on the farm real estate or looking for, you know, Greenstone and FSA can work together for um, the, the land. And then, and then maybe the Farm Service Agency would look at the, 
the lending on the equipment, you know, that everything isn't always put together and it, it, and so everything should always be segmented, I guess. And, um, and just look at different opportunities because if it doesn't work for Greenstone, there are other people such as Chris and Dave out there available to kind of look through at those requests and kind of work with you on your unique situation. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and for those of you who are putting in questions, uh, we will keep track of those and um, get you those answers in a follow up email. Um, thank you to our three lenders, uh, Jennifer, Chris and Dave. Um, and I hope all of you join us for their more in depth presentations slash question, uh, uh, question and answer um, in the following January, February and March dates. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to wrap this up. Thanks, Jay. And thank you, Dave, Jennifer, and Chris. It's always um, very informative to hear what, what your thoughts are. And we get the same kind of questions of how we might be able to better support farm businesses. Um, what you see on your screen now, hopefully, is a list of everybody's contact information. Feel free to reach out. I know we didn't get to all of the questions in the chat. I will get those questions together for our lenders. And those, if you please come back in January, February, and March, maybe we can get some of these questions answered for the whole group. Um, we also had this drawing for the Great Lakes Produce Expo. The numbers were 37 and 47. So Lindsay and Tasha were the people selected. And if you're interested in the mini grant for accessing accounting services, I put a link in the chat on how you can apply, but we'll also put it in a follow-up email. Anything else, team? Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody for being here. Hope to see you in January. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.